Keith Murray is a tra is a transdisciplinary mystic queerdo, an internationally recognized artist, designer, writer, activist, and facilitator le leading the LGBTQ2 plus affirming ministry at the Hillcrest United Church. Won't you w w join me in giving a warm welcome to Keith Murray. So they say that the only thing people fear more than the fear of death is public speaking. And I'm going to be talking about both, so <laughs> here we go. Oop, sorry. So 2017 was a shit year for me. I don't know if it was for you. My grandmother died, and uh, I was working in Vancouver in the downtown east side as a frontline mental health worker during the fentanyl crisis. There came a point where I was doing three overdose interventions a day. I came to a point where I hit a wall and I just couldn't see another blue body. I couldn't go into work. I developed PTSD. Um, repeatedly being in life and death uh, situations overstimulated my nervous system. I developed anxiety and panic attacks and I became fixated on the fear of death. So I went to Hawaii to try to relax and heal. It was always been a healing place for my family. We went there when my uncle was sick when he died, and uh, we were there when my grandma died, so we decided to go as a family and uh, heal and mourn my grandmother. It's hard to be depressed in paradise, but I discovered it's still possible. <laughs> <laughs> but the flowers and soothing ocean sounds started to work their magic. And one morning after a beautiful walk, I, my boyfriend asked me on a text, how was I doing? I was about to say, wonderful when my phone issues an alert. <laughs> Ballistic missile threat, inbound for Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. This is not a drill. My heart sank. My adrenaline rised. Luckily, I was sitting on the toilet. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of the five stages of grief. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross worked with people confronting their death and found there were five distinct stages that people went through. And uh, starting with denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. I go right to denial, of course, was my phone hacked. I am Googling, trying to get more information. There was nothing. My boyfriend over text informs me, he had already figured this out, that it takes 15 to 20 minutes for a missile to reach uh, Hawaii from North Korea. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and I hear in the condo next door, somebody got the same text. This is really happening. I enter into anger. Trump, that talking Cheeto, has been poking that cat in the cage, calling him Rocket Man. Of course this is happening. Hawaii is the closest American soil that um, one of his nukes could hit. Those pricks are going to kill me. <laughs> I go to tell my family, and my mother jumps right to acceptance. <laughs> If it's our day to meet the Lord, there's nothing we can do. She comforts me with the words of Julian of Norwich, all shall be well. But I'm not ready to accept. There's gotta be something we can do. I begin bargaining. I'm looking around, trying to figure out how to uh, fix things. My dad's on the toilet. <laughs> my niece is plugged in, blissfully unaware of what's going on. Um, where's my sister? I cannot find my sister. She's in the gym working out. So I have to leave the condo and risk going out into the open air and find my sister. We have to be together. While I'm in the garden, I'm trying to calculate <laughs> the blast radius. So I'm imagining that Kim Jong-un is going to try and hit Honolulu to get the most target. That's two islands over. Um, but it's one of his shitty missiles, so it could just as likely hit us anyhow. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, I remember my trip to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum and I'm suddenly thinking about all the ways I can die. I can go up in a blaze of glory and be emblazoned on concrete, or I can suffer third degree burns and when I try to drink water and quench my thirst, I will explode, or I could suffer a slow leukemia death. But I thought at least uh, we could take care of each other. 
I get to the gym and my sister's in a bit of denial, but we realize it's a concrete room with no windows and a steel door. So we form a plan. She tries calling her um, husband. We're heading back to get my niece and my parents. And I try calling my boyfriend, but we can't get through because all the lines are tied up. Um, we get back and my dad is still on the toilet. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, we need to go. And um, I try to get my dad to come, my mom to come. They want to stay in the hotel. They're all in different states of their own process of grieving. And uh, I'm filling a bag with coconut waters and granola bars, trying to get us what we need to survive, however know how long we're going to be in there. And my boyfriend on Wi-Fi, Skype, is in the depression phase, and I'm trying to console him at the same time while I'm doing all this. And my niece suddenly is like, what's going on? And I'm like, it's okay, and we're trying to figure this all out. And my dad is still on the toilet, and I should have gotten him that squatty potty for Christmas. <laughs> uh, so I, I take a minute, and I pray, and I breathe, and I realize that I have no control. I never did, only an illusion of it. And I realize there is nowhere I can go that my creator is not there. And I tell my boyfriend not to worry, that if we survive this, or if we don't, I'll find him again. So we head out, we finally get our stuff together, we finally get all of us together, and we start heading out into the garden towards the gym. I'm watching the bars on my Wi-Fi signal go, and I say my final good boys, goodbyes to my boyfriend. And then we run into somebody who says, oh, it was a false alarm. <laughs> And I'm not ready to believe it yet. I'm like, how do you know? And I'm looking on Google. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, well, we heard it on Twitter. And I'm like, on Twitter, they would come through. And then it came through. 38 <laughs> minutes later. Not, just kidding. <sighs> <sighs> I sat down and I cried. I'll tell you, Hawaii is a pretty lovely place. But that morning walking into town, people were practically high-fiving in the streets. <laughs> we were alive. There's nothing like being confronted with, the imminent with your imminent death than to get over your fear of it. And it's an experience I'm really grateful for. I think I wrote a whole page in my gratitude journal that night. Thank you. Thank you.